The aviation industry has always kept us on our toes. From the first model by the Wright brothers to the Dreamliners, the skies above us have seen technology at its finest. However, there is one legend in the Hall of Fame who happened to have disappeared so fast that its history has seemed to be of much curiosity, as is its odd shape and structure. Getting any ideas? Yes, we are talking about the Zeppelin. A Zeppelin is a rigid airship named after Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin, a German inventor who pioneered rigid airship construction at the turn of the 20th century. Zeppelin's ideas were first proposed in 1874 and fully fleshed out in 1893. In Germany, they were patented in 1895, while in the United States, they were patented in 1899. Following the enormous success of the Zeppelin design, the term Zeppelin came to refer to all rigid airships, a keel-like structure joining two exterior vehicles beneath the 128-meter, 420-foot vessel, each of which had a 16-horsepower motor geared to two propellers. The craft reached up to 32 kilometers, 20 miles per hour. During World War I, the Germans had moderate success in long-range bombing operations, using Zeppelin-type rigid airships that could reach greater heights than the warplanes available at the time. During 1917, German Zeppelins flew for nearly 100 hours on two occasions. Such feats led many to anticipate that giant airships would play an important role in aviation evolution. As part of Germany's post-war reparations, several Zeppelins were delivered to Allied countries. The two most renowned subsequent Zeppelins were the Grab Zeppelin, completed in September 1928, and the enormous Hindenburg, first flown in 1936. By the time it was decommissioned in 1937, the Grab Zeppelin had made 590 flights, including 104 ocean crossings, and had flown more than 1.6 million kilometers, 1 million miles. In 1929, the craft flew around the world for approximately 34,600 kilometers, 21,500 miles, in around 21 days. Now, what rewrote the future of the Zeppelins was the Hindenburg incident. Curious much? Keep watching ahead as we show you what led to the end of the Zeppelin era. The lifting gas is housed in one or more cells within the airship, and Zeppelins have a structural framework that retains their shape. In September 1852, the first steam-powered airship rose to the skies. Blimps promised to be the future of air transportation 51 years before the Wright brothers' first flight. Here are a few more incredible inventions that have impacted the world. Throughout World War II, these aircraft were utilized for advertising and military duties, such as surveillance and anti-submarine warfare. However, as time passed, airplane and helicopter technology advanced and became the more prevalent means of air transportation. Well, the reign of the Zeppelins seems to come to a drastic end with one disaster that shook the world in its wake. After several catastrophes, most notably the German airship Hindenburg, which burst into flames upon landing in New Jersey in 1937, killing 35 persons on board, the collapse of the Zeppelins was accelerated. The German Zeppelin Hindenburg detonated on May 6, 1937, engulfing the sky above Lakehurst, New Jersey, with smoke and fire. The gigantic airship's tail plummeted to the ground, while its hundreds of foot-long nose soared like a breaching whale. It was reduced to ash in less than a minute. Some passengers and staff members leaped dozens of feet to safety, while others perished in flames. 62 of the 97 passengers on board survived. The Hindenburg was meant to usher in a new era of airship travel. However, the disaster brought the century to an abrupt end, paving the way for the age of passenger airplanes. The crash was the first major technological tragedy captured on film, and the picture became imprinted in the public's mind. Oh, the humanity, said a horrified radio reporter, and the remark has since become somewhat of a catchphrase. Speculation regarding the cause of the disaster has inspired countless books and films. In that respect, it was like the Titanic, said Dan Grossman, an aviation historian at Airships.net, an author of Zeppelin Hindenburg, an illustrated history of LZ-129. Now, what was the real reason for the Zeppelin's end? What made the authorities take such drastic steps to end the advancements of this game-changing innovation? According to Grossman, there are various ideas about the cause of the disaster, ranging from ridiculous to plausible. There is zero debate among all credible researchers in the field about the fundamentals of what happened, he said. It has been determined that there was a breach in the fuel cells, which allowed hydrogen to escape and mix with oxygen, 
resulting in a highly flammable mixture that ignited and created a big fire. There is no evidence to validate the idea that a bomb or an arrow sabotaged the Hindenburg, or that the fire was caused by a chemical or material other than hydrogen. The most well-known lunatic hypothesis is that the fabric was particularly flammable. Grossman, who wrote an essay about Hindenburg myths, explained, it was not the case. There is no proof that it was. Lightning struck airships in general, and the Hindenburg in particular. Lightning strikes on hydrogen airships were common enough to burn holes in the covering, but they never created a fire since the hydrogen was not leaking. It is unknown why the hydrogen was escaping and how it ignited. There are many theories as to why the leak occurred, Adams stated. A popular idea holds that the sharp S-turn caused a wire to crack and cut through a gas cell, but this has been very much disproven, according to Grossman. Because all the evidence was destroyed, we'll probably never know why it leaked. Experts believe they know what triggered the fire. Electrostatic discharge and St. Elmo's fire are the two main theories. According to Grossman, both Adams and Grossman believe in the electrostatic discharge theory of igniting to the extent that you can state anything with certainty when recreating an accident. The large electric charge on the day created by the lightning showers is crucial in both hypotheses. You could still see lightning when the ship was landing, Grossman recalled. There was so much current in the air that neighboring rubber plants were forced to close. Rubber dust is particularly flammable. The ship was flying through the air with a positive charge. When the landing wires made contact with the earth, they were given a negative charge. It felt like stepping over the carpeting and hitting the doorknob. Adams explained, you are the positive charge, while the knob represents the negative charge. A spark is likely to leap whenever two electrical potentials differ. The feature of the electrostatic discharge idea that I find most convincing is that it is consistent with as much empirical evidence as we have, Grossman explained. There was a certain potential difference between the ship's metal framework, which was grounded by the landing lines, and the ship's fabric covering, which was electrically insulated from the framework. The charge in the fabric could not discharge or equalize because it was not attached to anything conductive. It was held together with non-conductive Rami ropes and wooden dowels. Because the ship was 60 to 80 meters in the water, you got a large electrical charge on the cloth and a different electrical charge on the framework. Roseman speculated that the spark could have been created by St. Elmo's fire or brush discharge, caused by a differential in electrical charges between an object and the air. It was possible because there was so much energy in the air. However, if there hadn't been a hydrogen leak, neither St. Elmo's fire nor electrostatic discharge would have been harmful. Some speculate that the disaster was the result of anti-Nazi sabotage. While Grossman remarked that many individuals would have preferred to see the Nazi ship burn, there is no physical or witness evidence to corroborate that idea. But, he continued, there is so much data pointing to the static electro-discharge explanation. The Nazi party pressured Hindenburg personnel to stick to a strict schedule for the final flight. Adams noted that while the Hindenburg was only half full on its voyage from Frankfurt to Lakehurst, the return flight was filled with celebrities, dignitaries, and other notables. They had to travel to Europe to attend the coronation of King George VI of the United Kingdom. After their deaths, laymen and press were chastised for caving into Nazi pressure and attempting to land the Hindenburg in hazardous conditions. According to Grossman, they should have waited for the electricity in the air to dissipate before landing. The Hindenburg disaster effectively terminated the airship era. Nobody wanted to travel with hydrogen ships anymore, they were terrified of them. According to Grossman, American and German businesses had plans to build more airships and considered the Hindenburg as a test case for their investment. Those plans were terminated following the crash. However, technological developments also contributed to Zeppelin's downfall. In 1928, the Hindenburg would have been an incredible technical achievement. However, by 1936, it was out of date due to fixed-wing heavier-than-air airplanes, Grossman explained. At the time of its inception, there were already airplanes that could fly faster, load more, fly cheaper, with fewer crew members, and were better in every manner. And that is what called down the Zeppelin era, probably for the best. Now that is engineer legacy for you folks. Make sure to like and share this video, and have a look at other interesting content across our channel. Don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned for more exciting content coming up ahead.